Buddha called his teaching a path that leads to results, which means that the test of anything you might do as you practice lies in the results it leads to. The Buddha himself never said that something had to be said by him in order to count his dhamma. And the forest Dajans make this point. Jamahabhu says the Buddhist teachings, as we have them in the texts, are like a big, a big pot of basic tonic. And then the good doctor knows what to add to the basic tonic for specific illnesses. And of course, as you practice, sometimes you're with the teacher and sometimes you're not. And when you're not with the teacher, you have to be your own doctor to figure out the illness, figure out what you might use as a medicine, and then look at the results. It's going to be experimental. But the Buddha does give some guidelines for judging. There's one passage where his stepmother comes and asks for a brief Dharma teaching that she can take in practice. And he answers with eight principles as to what kind of actions, what kind of teachings, what kind of practices count as Dharma and don't. They fall into three sets. The first set has to do with qualities that you develop within you. There's contentment. There's shedding, as the Buddha calls it, and then there's persistence. Contentment means that you learn to be satisfied with the situation. If it's good enough to practice in, it's good enough. We can probably think of all kinds of standards for judging this place as being deficient. It may not be the ideal place or your ideal place to meditate, but it's good enough. And if you can focus on how things outside are good enough, then you can turn inside and see what's not good enough inside, because that's where the real problem lies. As the Buddha said, the secret to his awakening was being not content with his own skillful qualities. That's what the effort should be. That's what the persistence is for, is to figure out how you can make yourself want to do what's skillful, even though you may not like it, and how you make yourself want to not do things that you'd like to do, but are going to lead to bad consequences. This ability to, as the Buddha says, generate desire is really important because, as he said, all things are rooted in desire. Unskillful things are rooted in desire. The path is rooted in desire. This means that you have to be discerning in which desires to cultivate, which ones to nurture, which ones you've got to cut off. And your willingness to put effort in here. That's what's important. If you get lazy around this issue, then you've wandered off. And finally, the shedding, as the Buddha calls it, basically shedding pride, shedding your conceit. Shedding your sense of having been wronged by other people. We carry a lot of things around. In the Buddhist term, we accumulate them, pile them up, they become our baggage. And when you recognize something in your mind you, where you're carrying baggage around, old resentments, the sense of pride, you have to let them go down, put them down. And you begin to realize that you were weigh weighing the mind down, even though you held on to these things tightly and cherished them. They really don't help you. So that's the first set. These are qualities that have to do with your own practice and its impact on your mind, what kind of person you become as you practice.
someone who's content, someone who has lots of persistence in the right direction, and someone who is unburdened by old resentments, old pride. The second set has to do with your impact on other people, or the impact that your practice has on other people. For one, you don't go around bragging. Ubhasika Gi has a lot of Dharma talks on this topic, about people who claim this attainment or that insight or this psychic power. And really, what your attainments are is no, nobody else's business. I noticed this when I was staying with John Fung. He was very circumspect. I was strongly convinced that he was psychic in a lot of ways. Number one, he seemed he could read my mind. But number two, he seemed to know a lot of other things as well. But he never mentioned it. Once or twice something would slip out, but very, very rarely. And then after he died, another monk moved into the place where he had been staying when he went to Bangkok. He was a famous Dharma teacher. He would come to Bangkok to give Dharma talks at these Buddhist organizations around the city. And he was constantly talking about seeing this and knowing that, and it was repelling. I figured it's none of my business. And he began to wonder why he would be talking about those things. So whatever good qualities you have, and this may not apply only to the meditation, but other good qualities you have, you don't brag about them. You just go about your business modestly. There's that great passage where the Buddha is talking with Sariputta, and he points out a novice. He says, see that novice over there? He's Anuruta's disciple. And every day he takes Anuruta's bowl and he levitates to the, a lake up in the Himalayas to wash the bowl in clear water and comes back. And his main thought always is, may no one know about me. It's a good example to follow. The second quality that has an impact on other people is that you try to be reclusive. You try not to get entangled with other people. Whatever work needs to be done in the monastery, you don't shirk your duties. But you learn how to do it with a minimum of chatter, minimum of talk, minimum of entanglement. Because the more entangled you get, the less time you have to practice inside. And it usually happens when we start working and we start chatting as we work. The filter in our conversation gets, gets wobbly, gets loose, things get let through. And after all, it's like we have no security check on our speech. People can get through with bombs and explosives. In other words, you start saying things and without even thinking about it, you get other people upset. Things you think may think are okay to ask about or talk about are not okay for other people. So it's good to keep a tight control on what you say and the extent to which you do get entangled with others. The final quality that has to do with your impact on others is you try to be unburdensome. You carry your load as best you can. You're trying to make sure that your needs are few. This is one of the reasons that we work with the breath. That's one of the ways that a monk in particular can be burdensome to other people is needing to go see doctors, needing medicines. And you've got this medicine right here. Work with your breath. See what you can do with your breath. And John Lee used to say that he would sit with a disease for three days to see if he could conquer the disease with his breath. And only after the third or fourth day would he think about seeing a doctor. So try to be light and unburdensome in other people. The final two qualities that the Buddha talked to his stepmother have to do with the goal of the practice, being unfettered and being dispassionate. Unfettered means the mind is free. 
all the ways we have of tying ourselves down, things we identify with so strongly. Remember the Buddha's image of the fire. The fire is trapped in its fuel, not because the fuel traps the fire, but the, because the fire holds on to the fuel. It's when the fire lets go, then it's freed. The fuel just sits there. It's not clinging to the fire. There's so many things we cling to and they tie us down. And so when you can recognize a thought going through the mind, it helps loosen up some of your attachments. Encourage that thought. Obviously, of course, this deals specifically with unskillful thoughts. You hold on to the skillful ones as long as you need them. But there will come a point where even the skillful thoughts have to be let go. We have this fascination with our thinking. And it's good to step back from your thoughts and see them as strange, see them as a process. Where they come from, where they go. And don't get so infatuated with the content inside. And this connects directly with the, the final quality, which is dispassion. When you see the process, you begin to see how artificial it is, how much you've been fabricating your experience, how much energy goes into it, and how little you have to show for it. Think of the Buddha's image of the world. This is before he ordained. He saw the world as a puddle in which their fish were fighting over the water, pushing one another out of the way. And yet they're all going to die anyhow. Years back, I was up in British Columbia. We were visiting a park, and it turned out it was the time when the salmon were coming up to spawn. First, they had to run the gauntlet. There was a beach through which this creek ran. On each side of the creek, there were birds that were ready to peck out the eyes of the salmon. And they finally got into the trees, the ones whose eyes weren't pecked out. And there was this huge pile of other dead salmon there in the water. And they were really were pushing one another out of the way. In the meantime, there were two bears scooping up as many salmon as they could. That's life, as we normally lead it. And it's good to have some dispassion for it, because we keep coming back, running the gauntlet through the beach, thinking we've accomplished something when we've got through the beach. Ah, then there's, then there's the bears. You want to tell yourself that there must be something better than this. It's not the case that the Buddha just bad mouths things to express his frustration. He has us look at the negative side of things that we've been seeing in such a positive light because he says that there's something much better. So these are the qualities we're aiming at. And these are our tests. When people gain attainments, it's not that they automatically say, oh, this must be it. The people who are really circumspect say, I've got to watch this for a while. One of the reasons we work with the breath is so that we can learn the process of fabrication really carefully. People sometimes ask, when you focus on the breath as your meditation topic, what are you going to focus on as you die when the breath leaves? Well, you notice in the Buddha's instructions in breath meditation, they deal not only with the breath, but also with metal fabrication and the instructions themselves are verbal fabrication. And in every case, you learn how to be sensitive to the extent to which you're fabricating things and learn how to do it more subtly, with more refinement. You still the fabrications, you calm the fabrications down. And as you do that, you get more and more sensitive to ways in which you fabricate your experience that you don't recognize. Until you say that even sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas, these are things you're fabricating. There's some raw material from the outside. It's not that you're making things up totally. 
But what you make has a lot of your input, or what you experience has a lot of your input. And as you get more and more sensitive to that, then when something unfabricated comes along, you recognize it as such. But still, there's always a possibility that there might be something subtle in there, so you keep watching. Everything gets tested. As I would have said, if you're honest, straightforward, and observant, you've got the qualities that are needed. Simply don't let the other things that are opposed to the Dharma get in the way.